Hi everyone. Hello. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another FAQ. We hope you're doing all well and safe in the situation. Um, as you know, we've been doing um, a number of FAQ videos and we've already had one with a guest and now we have our second FAQ with a guest. So we'd like to welcome Professor John Robinson um, onto our FAQ videos. Um, so we've compiled some questions for um, us to ask him. But before that, we'd like to thank him for joining us today. Um, we know everyone is really busy um, and we really, really appreciate it. But before we kick off, um, I'd just like to introduce everyone. So I'm Jane, I'm the Vice President Academic at the GSA. We also have Perna, our president with us, and we have Clara, our Vice President Academic. And John, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Yes, thanks very much, Jane. So I'm John Robinson, I'm a professor in electronic engineering but I'm also the Pro Vice Chancellor of Teaching, Learning and Students in the University. So in that role, I have oversight of our teaching, the way we deliver it and what we deliver, and I sit on the University Executive Board. So right now, or I should say for the past two months, I've been very involved in our contingency planning for going online in response to the pandemic. Thank you, John. So now we're going to move on to some questions and I'm going to start with the first one. So John, the first question we have is about the safety net. Um, so this is a really big um, topic of discussion among master students at the moment. Um, we know that master students don't have an equivalent safety net that undergraduate students have. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about that and also about um, some of the policy changes that have been made to help support postgraduate master students? Yes, sure. I think what's what's really guided us all along is is balancing support for students now at this really difficult time when uh, everyone has got a, a range of pressures and anxieties and concerns and support for students in the future when they're graduates of the university. Now, the first thing has meant trying to devise ways so that despite the strange situation, we can give proper academic support. And the second one has meant that our standards are gonna be maintained so that the value and the meaning of degrees are not in any way compromised because of the situation. So we've looked at this through a number of different lenses. And the one that the safety net is about is to do with how marks are combined and how they're used in the final calculation of a student's degree. So at undergraduate level, we have really applied two principles. Principle one is you still have to pass. You still have to fulfill the learning outcomes in just the way that you normally would have to. And this is the, the key way to maintain standards. And then the second thing is that in terms of your mark, the mark that eventually feeds forward to decide what class of degree you have, if we have enough information already to predict how you would have done if we'd not had the pandemic, then we use that as an estimator. And that estimator comes from before the pandemic and it gives a number. It gives a lower limit on what will be used as the average for the year. We hope students will continue to engage, will be able to, sh to show what they, can, uh, what they can do in their performance and, and quite possibly the safety net won't be needed. And in that case, all the calculations happen just as normal. But if it is needed, it's there. And it's there based on work already done. It's something that students can, can rely on to support them if because of these very difficult circumstances, um, they can't maintain the same level of performance. So that's the safety net. The idea is it's, it's something that, that we hope is not going to be needed because we really hope students concentrate on doing their very best, but if it is needed, it's there to catch students. Now, I said that we need 
a reliable estimator. We need sufficient evidence to be able to make a good prediction about how people would have performed. At undergraduate level, the way we do that is by taking all the work we've done so far this year, and then where we need to top up the, uh, the number of credits we need to form a reliable estimator from the previous year's average. That's something we can do as undergraduates, of course, because people are with us for several years. Um, at postgraduate, it's not possible to look back to top up. And so if we apply our rule that you need the equivalent of half a year's work to calculate the estimator, to, to make a reliable estimate, then uh, very few of our postgraduate students have that amount of work already marked and available. Some part-timers do, there are one or two other special cases, but in almost all cases, students have a significantly smaller proportion of their work already done. And in some cases, some postgraduates have not, none whatsoever. So we had to take a different approach for postgraduates. Now, just to go back to where I was a few minutes ago, the important thing is to maintain standards and to try to provide relief of anxiety, relief of the concerns students have at this time. So here's what we have done for postgraduate taught students, for master's students and for postgraduate diploma, postgraduate certificate students. Um, we, we have said that just like undergraduates, you still have to pass. So nothing's changed there. That is the, the maintenance of the baseline standards. You still have to pass, and if you pass, you get the degree. For postgraduate taught, there's two, as it were, levels. We don't call them classifications, but there's two things that you can have as well as a pass. You can have a merit, or you can have a distinction if you do really well. And uh, the short way of expressing it is that we have decided that to get a merit or to get a distinction, what we're looking for is merit level performance or distinction level performance in either the independent studies module or everything but the independent studies module. Now, normally we require distinction level performance in both to get a distinction or merit level performance in both to get, to get a merit. But we've said that you, you've got to perform at that level, you, you've got to be that good, but you only have to demonstrate it in one of those two cases. And, and part of the idea there is to, to cope with the variety of, of work people have done so far. It does mean that everyone has two opportunities, um, but also people who already do have quite a lot of work done, they, they get some reassurance from that. Not as much as a safety net, because there isn't quite enough to form the estimate, but there's, there's reassurance. And then the other things that we've changed is we've allowed for um, more credits to be, um, to be failed, but still enable someone to, to get a distinction or a merit. And the idea here is that there may be a, a time where there's a particularly acute effect of the pandemic. Uh, and this is, again, to sort of provide that reassurance that you're not going to lose out on a distinction or whatever because of, of that sort of localized effect. So um, yes, there's, there's no safety net as such for postgraduate talk, but the equivalent is uh, this, this change to the marking criteria for postgraduates. And I realize this has been a long answer, but, but before I finish, um, what I would say is that I think what we've done with respect to marks, how marks combine, is only a part of, of the attempt to balance supporting students now and supporting students in the future. So, for example, the ways that we've changed to online assessments, we've tried to understand that, that students, and actually in particular postgraduate taught students, often have uh, you know, uh, home situations and so on that just make it difficult to uh, set aside time for a 
a, a really focused time exam. Um, and so we've emphasized the coursework, we've emphasized 24 hour exams. Uh, and that I think has gone through to, to the enhanced dissertation support we're trying to provide as well. So, so on all of those, the, the idea is to try to render support because we're recognizing that these are really difficult times for, for people. Um, but we also want to assure all students that at the end of this, when you emerge with the University of York degree, merit and distinction, perhaps it means what it always did. Thank you for that, John. It's, it's really helpful to have a, a clear um, explanation of what those policy changes mean. Um, it's really helpful. So thank you for that explanation. I think we're going to move on to Perna now for the next question. Thank you, Jane. So when you agree, so you all um, touched a little bit on the support available to students, could you please expand this a little further and give the, give us a, like uh, information about what other support are available and you are offering to ensure that students are supported throughout their degrees? Yeah. Um, so I gave a long first answer, so I'll try and contain myself with this answer. And I'll start by saying that a, a lot of the support is to do with well-being, and you have spoken with Wayne about that. So I, I won't talk about that aspect, but it is really important, of course. Um, I think the academic support, the at this stage of the degree, particularly the, the supervisor, is particularly important. So we have asked that all departments ensure that supervisors are making regular contact with supervisees and also the department is providing other ways for students to keep in touch as we're in this dissertation phase. It's, it's also been the case that in some subjects we've had to ask supervisors and supervisees to change the direction of projects uh, and dissertations and that's because there isn't the access to equipment or some of the resources that there normally is. Um, that has been, uh, maybe I'll just say two things about that if I may. Um, on, on the one hand we, we really recognize that one of the reasons people come is for use of the resources that are here and so we, you know, we really sympathise with the fact that in some cases, whether it's a student in TFTI expecting to use a studio, or a student in chemistry expecting to use the lab, or a student in music expecting to, to have much more um, on-campus performance and so on, all of these things are, are real losses. And, and so what we've said is that, so far as absolutely possible, we have to try and work together so that the dissertation is, is changed to recognize the current context and students can proceed with a piece of work that examines them rigorously but is possible to do and, and where they can really show how well they can perform. Now that's a big ask in some of these cases where the, the missing things are, are really difficult but if possible we do want students to be able to graduate on time and and so the idea here is that there's a route to which students can can do that now all these things are case by case really and in some cases people will be having extensions and doing other things to to wait until they do eventually have access to to the resources but but the first thing i did want to say is that recognizing how, how difficult this is, recognizing that the, the lack of resource is a disappointment. We, we are hoping where we can to find ways to enable people to be able to, to show what they are capable of and to graduate on time. Um, and we, we are thinking as well about all sorts of ways when hopefully this is behind us, we can enable people to come back and have some of the hands-on activity that they might have missed out on. Um, and I think the other thing that I would just say, as well as the, the support for doing the work and the keeping in touch with students and so on, we have been 
very strong in saying to departments, be, be clear about what the marking criteria are now. Be clear about how things have changed because of the current context and ensure that students know that, that other markers and moderators know about that. Uh, and so again, this is, this is part of trying to um, be transparently fair. Uh, it's, 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 uh, we want to provide the support, but we equally want people <laughs> to be aware that um, we're not sort of waving things through in any way. We, we're trying to ensure that when you, you get your degree, uh, it, it shows that you've, you've really performed at the appropriate level. Thank you, John, for that answer. Um, I was wondering, because we receive kind of a lot of questions uh, from students not understanding what, what, what does it mean in the communication. So what does it mean that the students are going to receive a summary of their degree? Um, okay, so, uh, well, um, this is to do with the transcript. And we are looking at ways of providing choices for students for what the transcript will say, because we think we think some students want it not to mention the context at all. So we'll have to think about how we do that, because there's probably a case by case thing there where, uh, you know, a student in a very practical subject coming and saying, well, don't mention the context. That may not be possible because we've got to substitute one thing for another thing. So we have to work out how to do that. But for, for other students, the, um, I, the idea is that the, the, the transcript um, will explain the extraordinary times that we've, we've been in. But the reason for doing that, and I, I feel this is the third time I've said this now, so I'm repeating myself. The reason for doing that is to stress that the student has overcome the context because we have not relaxed our marking criteria. So the, it's, it's very important that the transcript does not give the impression that the degree has been marked leniently or that we've been somehow generous in our marking. Um, you know, what I'm trying to express is we're trying to be as empathetic and as helpful as we can in support, but the certificate and the transcript need to make clear that the student has performed at the level we normally expect. So, so that's what's meant by that, that explanation. That, and it will be a case of if students want that on their transcript, there'll be a, there'll be a choice about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, John. It's good to hear that um, students will, will will have the option to choose between what they have on their transcript. Um, I know that this is a, a an area of concern for um, international students and for anyone looking to work outside the UK. Um, so do you think that there's a possibility um, that international recruiters might perceive degrees that have been achieved this year differently in any way um, with or without um, those markers on the transcript? Um, well, it's a global issue, um, so I, I think I think that there is a possibility that recruiters may um, may draw their own conclusions. And uh, uh, the point of what we will put on the transcript, if student want, students want it, is in some ways to orient those assumptions that recruiters might have. Uh, it will be to make very clear that the, uh, the standards have been maintained, that student performance is measured in the same way as usual. Um, and I think that that is, is, is really, well, if there's more that we can do in terms of equipping students for presenting themselves to employers, we're very happy to look at those things, but, but that, that's the basic intention of what we're trying. Thank you. Um, so the next question, like um, there are lo lots of uncertainties around the changing lockdown advice uh, coming from the government. And also like you already mentioned that 
uh, master's students, um, like if their students, if their study, if their project is not applicable to be done at this uh, like circumstances that they can adapt. But also like what would happen, um, like let's say um, we go back to like not our normal and like what is being done for master's students basically to sum it up uh, who need to access on campus facilities uh, to complete their research project so i know you alluded it a little but i want you to expand on it a little bit more thank you yeah um but it, it's really summed up in the first thing you said Fern, that um government advice is changing and we are really now thinking in terms of the autumn term and what can be done there. And we're looking at several scenarios, one of which includes continued lockdown. Um, and, but most, I think, are based on the idea of social distancing. And how do we use our physical resources um, in the best way, given the likelihood that people will have to be kept apart. Um, meanwhile, there is the question of uh, students who are still online and students who are on campus. All of this really is just agreeing with your preamble, um, Perna, that, that we don't know how it will be. And we're making plans. We are trying to uh, establish some uh, a framework that departments can, can work to to do their planning for next year, but understanding that things might change as, as they go along. Now, within that context, the specific question that you've asked, I'm afraid I'm gonna say I don't know because we're just mapping out the sort of high level look at, at how students might be housed, what might be open, how what we do about equity across different students within a cohort as well as across all different sorts of students uh, and so I don't have any specific answers. Okay thank you. We will have to deal with uncertainty. So the, we are coming to the end of our session now and I know the library has been working really hard during the last weeks uh, so I wanted to ask you what is the library and archives doing to support students and make sure they have access to resources because most of them are missing that library. <laughs> yeah for sure well I think the library has been missed as a, as a place, a place of study as well as uh, for its resources. In terms of resources, the library has moved a, a lot of resources online and it, it has begun a physical delivery service, um, which is with partners. We, we can't actually get into the library, so that's not delivering our own books, that's delivering other books. But there are supply chain difficulties with that, and particularly for people who are overseas, there are concerns as well. Um, nonetheless, uh, a lot of alternative resources have been provided, many online. The best advice really that, that I can give is, is for students to keep in touch through their department with their academic liaison librarian, because um, this is being addressed at a cohort level. It's being addressed in terms of what a program demands and what can be substituted. So, um, there are FAQs on the library's website, uh, those are general, but really I think uh, communicating directly with the liaison librarian is the best thing to do. Thank you. So we've come to the end of the session. I think we've addressed quite a number of areas and I would like to thank Professor Jim Robinson for his detailed answers and for his time. Uh, we are going to continue to do the seven Qs with the students because um, I know you are appreciating it and we thank you for all of the questions and emails that you are sending to us during these times. Please continue to do so uh, and see you around next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.